Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's for me probably the, the shortest trip from Amsterdam to Leeuwarden, uh, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been, it's not for me the first time in this city. I have worked in my previous uh, life as an architect for Klaus and Kahn Architects. I worked on a project here in Leeuwarden, which brought me to this city uh, quite a, lo a lot of times. So I'm happy to be back in a way. Um, I'm going to speak about um, the project Kleiberg, uh, the flat, as we uh, called it when we were doing it. Uh, the project actually won the Mies van der Rohe Award. I think this is a very important distinction. It's not my personal prize or my colleagues from NL Architects who received the prize, but the project received the prize and everybody working on it. Um, it's actually one of my first projects, um, which has been incredibly uh, exciting to, to have one of these really experimental projects at the, really at the starting point of my professional career with my own office. And then to be given this incredible honor of, of the Mies van der Rohe Award um, is, 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 is quite, some, quite something. Something we were quite surprised by also. Um, magic button, where do I point that? Always the same, eh? Yes. Probably the rest will come uh, quickly. Um, now because uh, not only was it, from a kind of a personal point of view, very uh, surprising to, 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 to have this Mies van der Rohe award awarded to our project, but it was also very um, uh, unusual from the history of the, um, of the prize. Uh, the prize has been given for, the I think, the 15th time to our project. And before us, um, very exceptional projects like uh, museums, uh, also opera buildings, uh, um, embassy buildings, uh, high-end office buildings have been awarded to um, have been awarded with the Mies van der Rohe Award. The, let's say one percent of e exemplary architecture, exemplary project. And this time, the jury decided. Uh, the jury is chaired by Stephen Bates. Uh, decided to award for the first time this prize to a housing project and to a re reuse project, uh, a project which is rather mundane in its subject matter, um, housing for the, let's say the ordinary everyday uh, inhabitants of our cities. And um, this is what was quite a bold and surprising decision by the jury, but I think also a kind of a, a hint of a kind of a new direction of what architecture, at least according to the jury, should go. And Mies van der Rohe Award, of course, has the uh, incredible reputation that it's uh, quite, um, quite on top of these things. So our project is uh, about architecture of the ordinary instead of architecture of the uh, exemplary. Um, and for me, uh, the, the notion of reuse, which is uh, of critical importance in our project, is, is something more than just a pragmatic attitude towards a piece of uh, our city, which we have reappropriated and reused. But um, it, it is something for me, uh, this reuse issue is for me something which has a wider um, uh, meaning. It's, not, it is not, it's more than pragmatism. I think it's, you could see it as a kind of um, ideological shift, maybe, maybe even called a kind of, kind of a paradigm shift, where we have been uh, working from a kind of ideology of the new with the idea of growth associated to it, um, the modernist ideal that we're going to build a brand new future for ourselves, uh, replacing uh, the, the existing future to a uh, ideas in which the, of the donut economy and circularity, which are very much more into a kind of um, circular uh, idea of, of the existing and, and, the, and the new to be more in, 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 in link with each other. So I think we could have this reuse idea also as a kind of a reframing re of uh, also our architectural ambitions to an ideology of the renewed. And I think this, um, this, is, quite, uh, this is not very clear yet, I think, but I think there, is all, there are a lot of hints that be pointing in this, in this direction. Um, what is important for me in this is that um, I think architecture alone is not really that interesting or that relevant. Architecture can only uh, kind of generate something uh, meaningful and valuable for, for the economy, for society in, as a whole, when it's in sync with um, the realm of power, of politics, and the uh, ideologies and ambitions within it, and the, the kind of the, um, the, the, the situation in, in, in the kind of monetary, the financial aspect of, the, of our world, the, the material economics. If they are all in tune with each other, if they all kind of strengthen each other, there's something uh, great happening. And um, Kleiberg uh, is originally a building from the early 70s and as such a, um, a kind of an iconic example of 20th century modernist uh, housing. And I think it comes from a period, from the post-war period, in which these three aspects were in a, in a kind of a perfect sync. There was the architectural idea of the functional city, there was the material economics of standardized pre-cost concrete uh, system building, Plattenbau, and there was this political ambition to, to make a welfare state, 
and they all three, they all perfectly aligned in a way. They, they kind of uh, fed on each other and, and strengthened each other as an idea. And Kleiberg is um, originally an iconic example of, of this way of thinking. A way of thinking which was at the time so powerful and so optimistic in a way that uh, Le Corbusier uh, was of course, had the kind of um, bold idea that uh, the existing Parisian uh, cityscape could be bulldozed away to be replaced by this modernist ideal. Um, bright future ahead, make, make, make way for it. But the reality is that this, this new modernist agenda is actually has been added to the city, the existing city, instead of replacing the existing city. These are the numbers for uh, Holland, uh, for housing. In the post-war period, we had 10 million inhabitants and 2.1 million houses. Um, in the meantime, until this day, we built, uh, we have now seven and a half million houses. So we built six, six, six and a half we built. We demolished one million houses, but this extra of six and a half million has been added towards our cities instead of replacing our existing city. And you can see this in Amsterdam, for instance. This was Amsterdam after the Second World War, and you see this kind of explosive growth of the city. And the Belmar Mears, this little red island uh, southeast of the city, was one part of it. Um, so I think we're, we're coming from a period in which we have built something new, adding to the city, and leaving the existing city, as it were, uh, as a kind of a, a, a messy piece in the middle, which is now again going to, is going to be, has been uh, reappropriated and uh, reclaimed. And this, this new city that was going to be added to the city, this was uh, one of the images of the Belmar Mare, was going to be the perfect city without all the ailings of the existing city. It was going to be a bright new future offering all the um, scientific knowledge about creating perfect cities in the, um, in the, in the, for the future, for the, for the 20th century. And this was not something specific for Holland. This has been a kind of a European project, as it were, from Vienna to Geneva to uh, Toulouse and Amsterdam, uh, apart from some very interesting uh, structural uh, similarities in the architecture. They are all about housing uh, the ordinary uh, people in the city. And these buildings, they formed the urban mass. They made the city, this new city, this modernist city. And as it were, the Belvermeer is, um, I think, the most iconic Dutch example of this, this way of city making in the 20th century. Um, it is a perfect example of the welfare state casting concrete. It's one of the most iconic manifestations of the functional city in, in Holland. And it is the most extreme version of this Plattenbau building in Holland, in which a city of 100,000 inhabitants was built in less than 10 years. Um, this is the entire scope of the Belvermeer. Um, and in the bracket is uh, Kleiberg. You see, it's, uh, although it's a building of 400 meters long, it's still a, a small part of it. Uh, it were going to be 40,000 housing units. 90% of it was high rise like Kleiberg. And um, it was going to house 100,000 inhabitants, or, although that was the ambition originally. And um, kind of taking this idea of adding to the city to its extreme, it was built completely outside the city. This is a map from uh, the Amsterdam just after the Second World War. Um, and it was built in the Belmar Meer, a, a former lake, which had been uh, made into agricultural land in, in good uh, civil engineering tradition from Holland, and built without any traces of history or existing populations or, or existing urban structures. It was kind of built on the tabula rasa, uh, built to perfection without any obstacle. And uh, the Belmar Meer was, in a way, not a new idea in itself. It, it, it has, it's a kind of a supersized version of what started with Unité d'Habitation only 350 uh, uh, units approximately through, uh, for instance, Park Hill in Sheffield, which is already 1,000 units to this kind of incredible overdose version of the Belmar which was 40,000 units. And what's for me interesting about the way society at the time was, in Unité d'Habitation, there were 23 types of housing and in the Belmar Mere, which is 100 times larger, there are only seven types more. So apparently society was so easy and so simple to, uh, to, to house that with approximately 25 to 30 housing types, you could house 100,000 inhabitants, something which is nowadays very different. This was a starting point for, uh, for us for the project. Um, uh, Kleiberg sitting in the park-like landscape with a large parking garage to the south, which uh, was this kind of separation of traffic flows from the CM thoughts. You would park your car in the park garage, and then you would go through the building or through the park to your, to your apartment. You also see a subway line uh, elevated subway line cutting through the park, um, the kind of umbilical cord to the city center. Um, we worked on the basis of work of our colleagues before us. Um, above, uh, on the top, there's um, um, 
I've got I've lost the name. Siefried Nassut, I'm sorry. Uh, city planner for the municipality of Amsterdam, and he and his team, they, um, the model uh, showed this, uh, kind of made this Gesamtkunstwerk of, of city planning, construction, park, up to the trees, all the old public infrastructure, everything was planned top down in a kind of a perfect symbiosis of uh, urbanism, science, and architecture. Um, well, as the buildings in the Belmermeer were built by four buildings, construction companies using four industrial building systems, uh, our, our, the building of Kleiberg was Intervam system, and Intervam asked Fop Ottenhoff, the guy to the bottom, on the bottom right, to design its building. And he is, of course, not a star architect, and Sifrit Nasut was that, wasn't that too. He was just a kind of a civil servant plus, um, adding to uh, making affordable housing for as many people with the highest uh, standard as possible. Um, quite a different uh, mindset than most architects are viewed today. Um, whereas in many places in Europe, these kind of cities were very successful, like Alt Erla in, in Vienna, which is very, and also the project in Geneva, which are very, very popular still today. The Belmermeer wasn't so lucky as it were. Um, it never really, uh, the, its bright future never really materialized um, from all kinds of reasons. One of them is that it was built just before the, um, the start of the kind of postmodernist discourse. So the Belmermeer was never really kind of seen in, um, in, in the light that it was perceived in. And uh, this led to a kind of a social and economic downturn in, in, in the neighborhood which only changed in 1992 when a plane crashed into uh, a building opposite of Kleiberg. And it's, that was the starting point for a kind of regeneration of the neighborhood. But uh, given the, um, the ideas of that day, the results were quite different from what, for example, OMA already started in the 10 years after the completion of the Bauermeer. OMA Ram Kohas proposed a kind of a densification and, 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 and complexification uh, strategy for the Bauermeer to add to its kind of uh, um, homogenic uh, urban structure, to, to plant new structures in it, you could kind of uh, reuse avant la lettre, um, to add to the existing fabric and to, to make it more, inc more interesting. Instead of this strategy, the, it was kind of inevitable, um, and you could question now how inevitable it actually was, but at the time it was inevitable to demolish 75% of the original Baumamir only 25 years after its, uh, its completion. And it has been replaced in blue with kind of the low rise generic residential housing that uh, we have all over Europe. So from a very specific urban environment, uh, it was replaced by something very generic and, and, and rather mundane actually. And this kind of erasing of this uh, modernist uh, futuristic architecture is uh, something which uh, Renier de Graaf, for instance, documents in his latest book in a kind of a photo essay and he proposes that this was kind of a second, second European project. We first built it everywhere over Europe, and then from a kind of incredible shift of perspective, it, it all started to be erased again, uh, demolishing an incredible amount of housing, uh, actually, I think, in the end, quite good housing, but from a kind of parent, uh, way of looking at it, it was never appreciated in its, in its true form. This was also happening to the Belmermeer. And this was also going to happen to Kleiberg. Kleiberg uh, had remained, uh, was saved from this, uh, this demolishment, but um, the renovation plans for the project would cost 70 million euros, an incredible amount. Greg Lynn, the American architect, made a very um, over-the-top design proposal for that. And when the economic crisis hit, the owner, Rochdale, uh, could not afford to spend 70 million euros on this building. So Kleiberg was going to demolish also, unfortunately. And this is when our project started. It started from uh, a, a couple of really activist uh, inhabitants of the neighborhood who really opposed the demolishing of Kleiberg. For them, it was uh, one of the cornerstones of the last remaining fragment of the original Balmamir. And this led to so much interest from uh, specifically one journalist who went to uh, the housing corporation Rochdale and asked them if there was any, any possibility to save this building. The demolition permit already, had already been issued. People were already housed out, out of the project. And he kind of jokingly said, well, if there's somebody with a good idea, he can buy the building for one euro. And this became, purely by accident, a lucky accident, this became a newspaper headline in the Parol, the local newspaper in Amsterdam. And my client, Martijn Blom, uh, picked up on this. He is a project developer. And he said, this is a, a very interesting challenge. There's this great building sitting in the Belmermeer, which is very, still not very popular in, in, in Holland. But it is an iconic building. We should be do, able to do something with it. And he and a couple of colleagues of him, they all pitched in, put in 25 cents. There were four of them. And they uh, went to Rochdale and said, 
wow, we want to do this. And of course, this was not the idea for Rochdale. So there was a tender and after, I con this was my starting point for me, I, I contributed to this, to this tender. In the end, this became our project. And the, the key notion of this project was to make it a klus flat in Dutch, a do-it-yourself apartment building. And through this concept, which was completely alien from any regular project development concept, um, we could, uh, the, there was a perspective of saving Kleiberg. And the starting point for our proposal was that we didn't go for the kind of the gloomy uh, image of the Delmermeer, but we actually went there and saw for ourselves what a great metropolitan landscape it was. Um, this kind of Siam idea of living in a green park-like landscape with water, with, with public transport, with pedestrian routes, with, with playgrounds, with uh, places to do uh, physical exercises, it was all there and it was actually an incredible uh, site. Um, so instead of this kind of prejudice, we went for what we found really there and the qualities which are in abundance were there already. And we kind of uh, took this as a starting point. So there, there was this, this, this idea of the local neighborhood to save this building, which is a kind of a social energy, but also the kind of architectural and urban energy of the area was, was very powerful. This was the starting point, this appreciation of what everybody kind of did not appreciate. And our idea to make it a, a do-it-yourself apartment building has kind of two parts. Uh, it, it started from the idea that this building was, as a housing project, so good that we didn't do, actually have to, have to do anything to the houses itself. We could offer them as kind of an open structure, as a, as a framework for people to do their own thing in it, to make their own apartments inside the framework of, of Kleiberg, which made for us the business case very simple because we didn't have to finish all these apartments on the inside. Uh, which make the business case within the economic crisis, this is 2011, 2012, 12, uh, simple and, and, and possible and feasible. In the end, we only had the, the only feasible option, uh, proposal. We, uh, we would offer only half a project to the future inhabitants, so it could be very cheap. It could be as affordable as social housing. Our mortgage rents, this is a market development, uh, this mortgage rents for it would be uh, similar to social housing rents for a similar sized apartment. And we would offer people the opportunity to do anything within this framework. Um, they could build their own dream, whereas people usually um, um, kind of um, forced to accept what's on the market. Um, they are now able to, to make something which is really uh, closely connected to their own way of living. We would offer them affordable flexibility. And, and this was kind of the, the earliest conceptual sketches. Behind the front door, we had great apartments structurally. Uh, we would offer individual freedom to, to do all kinds of things to the apartments. People could do it for themselves. And between the front door and the city, some kind of the collective structure that uh, Kleiberg is, we would fix the, 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 the issues which come really from the functionalist dogmas uh, of, of the original Balmermeer. We would renovate this as a collective framework and we would do this as professionals, as project developers, client, uh, um, construction company architects. And this was our project, but this was only half the project. And uh, part of this project uh, notion of doing it, having people let, doing it themselves, that instead of this very simple 30 types of the original Dahomey, there is no nuclear family anymore living in the city. There is an enormous range and multiplicity of, of forms of living um, um, from in, 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 in size, in, in, in co-op uh, forms. We don't know these forms. There are so, there's such a rich complexity, a rich diversity that the only way to de develop in a meaningful way for, for the, the, the urban resident today, I think, is to do it with them instead of for them. Um, and with them, in this case, means giving them uh, literally the tools to, to do it. And um, also it is um, um, something, um, this kind of new framework of how we do housing. We now have 7.7 .7 million houses. We're going to add 1 million extra. Um, so this could be seen as this ongoing uh, adding to the city, but um, the kind of the, the background for this growth in houses is, is quite different. Um, there is no longer the, the, the idea of suburban living is no longer the dominant uh, issue, the way of living. Uh, the notion of reuse in our existing cities is, is something which has much, come much more on the foreground. We're not um, building for a, a growing society, but for an aging society, and the actual only growth in um, and housing now comes from migration into our cities. Uh, we're no longer, uh, we, haven't, we don't have new families, but we have new and completely different ways of living. So a transformation is for me uh, of the existing city is, and, and, and housing the people, the, this new request for housing has to be solved within the existing city. 
And if you also see, if we are thinking about circular economy, about making us an inclusive city, remaining our cities inclusive, we have to deal with 50% to be built extra, added to the city, but we still have 85% of heritage um, uh, to, be deal, to, be, to deal with to, uh, to, to reach these goals. And um, in Holland, only 20% of, um, of this housing stock is from the post of the pre-war period. So most of it is from the period since 1995 until now. So this kind of modernist urban uh, frame, uh, structure is the kind of dominant issue to deal with in our cities. And Kleiberg is an example for that. And the way we did it is to start from this kind of ideal standard that, uh, that Kleiberg offers in these 30 ideal housing types. We kind of, <coughs> a worthless perfection as we, as we called it, we peeled off, kind of, we kind of peeled off to the parts, layers of, the, of this design, kind of going back to the urban structure of the Kleiberg was when it was built. And then together in a collaborative way, we reused this structure to, uh, to build a new form of housing together with uh, new inhabitants. And the starting point is open framework. This, this, this structural framework was literally what is shown in the image, a, an, 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 an image, an, an apartment without any kind of aesthetic uh, um, um, uh, interventions. We only um, kind of improved the facade from a sustainability point of view, an energy point of view. We brought in new installations uh, for the people, for the new inhabitants to plug into, but for the rest, the tiles, the, 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 the wallpaper was still on the wall. This was the starting point for everybody to build their own dream in. And to add to the possibilities, we, mo we opened up uh, the, the framework with extra breakthroughs, horizontal, vertical, to con connect, combine apartments. And we made a kind of a Lego set of, of facade options that could be plugged into the existing structure so the building could be uh, changed uh, according to the floor plans that emerged. And all these interventions by the future inhabitants led to a kind of true diversity in the, within the structure, um, which is not a kind of aesthetic uh, diversity we like to design as architects, but something that's really closely linked to the ways of living of the inhabitants. Um, quite surprising ways, ways we could have never have imagined as architects ourselves. Um, and, and, and as such, much more interesting also, I think, than uh, if we design it for ourselves. The collective parts are some really, uh, as I said, some interventions directed at, at, at fixing some issues which are about uh, the, the functionalist dogmas that, that drove the design of the building. Um, we added some elevators that, already, that had been added on the outside of the building. We added them inside the building, kind of restoring the kind of the clarity of the monumental uh, form. There are many small underpasses underneath the building, which were very unsafe. We closed them down and, and combined them to a couple of larger ones connected also the entrances of the building to it. And the most important one, we took out all the storage spaces uh, on the ground floor, which is a very typical thing to have, moved them up to the upper stories um, uh, so we could open up the ground floor for housing and small business units so the ground floor could have an active relationship with the park and the, the city again. So from the left, it became the right, the openings, the monumental entrances, we took out the external staircases from a dead zone on the ground floor, we make, made an open zone with a lot of front doors, with a lot of activity and diversity and only collective bicycle storages on the ground floor. And from this really small mouse hole-like underpasses, this was actually the largest one, we made them twice as high and twice as wide and kind of reinstated the pilotis of Le Corbusier in parts of the building. <coughs> and from an aesthetic point of view, our, the, the kind of the, 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 the concrete quality of the project was a kind of a, 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 a something found in project, a, a kind of a next happy accident. The, paint, the building had been painted, and when we were investigating if the concrete underneath the painting was good enough to be repainted, uh, we discovered that the concrete itself was actually so beautiful that we uh, left it just as it was, kind of showing its concrete beauty. It was, it was such incredible quality concrete, really um, what you expect from industrial uh, ways of building. So after we did these collective interventions, the people uh, started to work it on, on themselves. And this, this, they had a year to finish their own apartment within the, the structure. It was a kind of uh, legally bounded, bound in the contracts we, we signed with them. And this, this kind of collective working on the project uh, was an incredible way of strengthening a community before people started to actually live there. This, this way of, of working, of, of exchanging ideas, exchanging telephone numbers of a plumber or a, or, or a plasterer, was an incredible uh, way of, of, of kind of for people to individually uh, own their apartment in a much more direct way, but also to strengthen relationship between the inhabitants. 
which kind of made the com this building not only a kind of a physical community, but also a much more a social community than you would normally have. Leading to all kinds of different ways of inhabiting this building from a kind of urban chic uh, way in which the concrete has a, 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 a really telling uh, quality in the interior to much more, let's say, simple, urban, uh, white, uh, shiny interiors to very um, um, intellectual uh, interventions in play of, of structure and in build, fill in, like for my colleague uh, Jans van Grunsven. And uh, these guys from uh, Klei Kloster, um, he, they were uh, actually the guys, the people that used the, the possibilities in Kleiberg to the fullest. This is a group of five or six, five uh, Pro Christian, Protestant uh, Christian families who found their own monastery, as they called it, a, a, a co-living um, um, uh, group uh, with uh, their own chapel, with places for people to have their own, uh, to, to, to have a kind of a, a break. Uh, I won't say hotel rooms, but guest rooms for people who have some problems with uh, getting back on their feet after divorce or, or whatever. And in good monastic tradition, they started to brew their own beer, um, which is uh, probably the first and the last time I'll have a project with beer. Um, it's very nice. So if you're in Amsterdam, not Leeuwarden, but in, Amsterdam, in, in the real Amsterdam, then uh, please, uh, please try a Kleiber beer. And the great thing is that um, although from uh, our collective intervention, the building was kind of reinstated in its monumental, brutalist, brutal glory, um, it is essentially a beehive with 500 individual stories, 500 individual ways of living um, with a much stronger uh, personal uh, connection between the inhabitants than I know from any other project that I've been working on of this size. And it's kind of re-established uh, re re the, the original ambitions of the Siam um, in, in a quite surprising way, um, which kind of... Um, Let's for to the question, uh, why did we demolish all these buildings? And the interesting thing is, after we finished Kleiberg, uh, this was the last not renovated, not yet renovated building in the Belmermeer. We had still 7,000 people on a waiting list interested to, um, to go on in the next building, but unfortunately, this next building was no longer there. And uh, we're really proud on this project, and we're really happy to have been given this, this, this kind of this concrete beast, this, this, this monster in the eyes of many, a kind of really interesting and living uh, new, new second lease of life, um, which is, as, as I said, part of our work, but most of all part of the inhabitants that now live there. Thank you very much.